Amen. Well, hey, I'm so glad that you joined us for church uh, this morning. I'm so glad that uh, wherever you're at, I'm so glad that you've chosen to be with us. Listen, I'm not going to uh, belay the point. I just want to be able to get right into it. So do me a favor. Go grab your Bible and go with me to John chapter number 13. John chapter 13. We, we've been in uh, a series that we've basically just been going uh, through the book of Acts. Uh, and as soon as we got to Acts uh, chapter 7, there's a passage in Acts 7, 49, during Stephen's speech where um, he, he addresses and he speaks on this dialogue that God had with David. And God told David, basically in verse 49, he said, you know, would you build me a house? And what kind of dwelling place would you build for me? What would the place of my rest be? And I wanted to focus on that a little bit. You know, I wanted to make sure that we stayed on this because I think the concept of God's house you know, for us in the United States of America, in a Western type of civilization in 2020, I think um, we, we've kind of departed from, from what God had originally intended. And so I wanted to focus back on this. So do me a favor, John ch chapter 13, if you're there, um, go ahead and open your Bible and go with me there. But starting in verse number 34, here's what the Bible says. These are Jesus's words now, and he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, turning to your neighbor, say, by this, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one and another. One another. One and another. <laughs> Listen. We're in a sermon series, like I said, that I've been talking about God's house, his house, his chosen or preferred dwelling place. And one of the key important aspects of God's house is this attribute of togetherness, or as Jesus describes it here, it's the act of uh, one another, you know, or, you know, I like how Francis Chan says it, he says it in John 13 is our one anothering. So our one anothering is something that I want to address today. Listen, just from a standpoint of being together, I want to communicate how important this is. Listen, gathering is a big deal. Being together is a big deal. And throughout scripture, more times than not, the supernatural happened in the context of believers being together. So today, rather than, um, you know, speaking on this general aspect of togetherness, I want to focus on you know, basically two things on, forget, uh, on togetherness. One of them is why together matters. And the second thing is I want to I wanna point you to the results of our togetherness or our one anothering. That way we can, we, when we see it, we know what it is. And so um, why should we focus on the why? This is a question, you know, that, that, that I've used to, to just prepare, to self-examine why, why do we look at the why? And, and here's what I believe. If the why is important, then we're going to do whatever it takes to figure out the how. The why in your life has to be important. Why do you raise your kids right? And why should you do that? Because it's important to me. That's why. Well, why do you want to eat better? Because I value my health and I want that to be better. And if that's better, you know, you get connected to the why, you're going to do everything that you can to make the how happen. And so to me, <laughs> look, it's an understatement to say the least that this is one of the weirdest times that we've ever experienced. This is one of the weirdest seasons that we've ever lived through. And I know that church gatherings, as we've known it, it's changed. It's morphed into something different and something that we're not uh, necessarily used to. So we pivoted in, in, in a way so that our together can still happen, you know, that, that we've pivoted into meeting online, we've uh, chosen to gather from a distance in some scenarios, but also, you know, now that uh, restrictions are, are somewhat lifted or somewhat, you know, uh, um, loosened, so to speak, we've also began gathering face-to-face -face in smaller groups. But, you know, I need you to hear this because what we're doing now may not be our preference, but the why or the reason that we ought to gather 
should be far more important than how we gather. Listen, the, the why of corporate worship, of studying the Holy Scriptures together, of gathering, you know, as Holy Ghost, Spirit-filled, devil-stomping, you know, uh, Christians, believers, that's important. And if it's important, then we need, we need to figure out the how in this season to continue to gather and, and, and you know, basically uh, be obedient and be uh, um, honoring to our government, to, to the people that are above us. You know, the Bible says it all the time. It says, you know, pray for the peace of your city so in its peace you would have peace. You know, we're called to be peaceful, abiding citizens, you know, in this world that we're not a part of, really. And so if we can do that, I believe that honors God. But, you know, also at the same point, we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves because there's power in, in that that we do it. And so, you know, let me say it to you this way. It's the message that never changes. The methods can change depending on the season, but the message is what never changes. And, and, and if we're changing uh, our methods, if changing our methods leads us to becoming more effective in our walk with the Lord, your walk with the Lord, then to me, this is reason enough for us to adapt. And I think that that's important. You know, hear me on this. So God did not create this coronavirus thing or incite it so that he can just, you know, uh, uh, pronounce judgment on his people. He didn't want to incite a pandemic so that we could experience difficulty in life. This is not what God does. But what if God used this season so that we would reevaluate how we were gathering and so that we could become more effective. Something that I want you to remember and something that I want you to think about is that we ought to desire effectiveness in our gatherings instead of holding on so tight to our preferences. I would rather be effective and change the way that we've been doing things just instead of holding on to, to something, oh, well, we've been doing it this way. You know, I used to manage uh, uh, people in, in a different setting other than church. And when I first came on board, people would always tell me, well, this is just the way that we always did it. And they never once asked if it was effective. That's just the way that they were doing it. And, you know, and the P&L lines uh, uh, for the place that I, was, uh, that I came and took over, they were in the negative and they were, you know, in the red. And when I came, came in, you know, I asked them, why are we doing it this way? And the response was, well, just because we've always done it. What if God wanted to shift us from the way that we've always done our gatherings, where we've always chosen to be together so that we could become more effective? I think that we need to think about these things. So, you know, that's why. There's, there's a, a why our gathering is important. And, and let me give you, you know, three specific reasons why our um, gathering, why our you know, act of being together, why our one anothering is important. So here's the first one. Jesus said so. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that's good enough reason for me. Jesus said so. And, and here's how he said it in John 13. He said, a new commandment I give you. It's a commandment. It's, uh, uh, you know, it, one of the definitions in strong concordance is that it's an injunction. What's an injunction? It's an authoritative order. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords has issued a commandment, not a suggestion, not a, oh, hey, this might be a good idea, you know. So if he says that one anothering is important, is a commandment that we give to one another, that in our one anothering we ought to love, then to me, that's good enough reason to obey. Somebody say amen to that. So, that's reason why, number one. Here's number two. One another is, a, is where the transaction of love takes place. One another is where the transaction of love takes place. So if you, if you could serve love on a plate, one another would be that plate. In order for love to be demonstrated, there has to be some one anothering going on, so to speak. And so um, it, it's, it's love has no outlet if there's no one another taking place. In other words, love, the love of God is not meant to just die and just rest in you. It's meant to be given to somebody. 
given away so that people would look at our good deeds and give glory to our God who is in heaven. Let your light so shine before men. And one of the ways that our light shines is through this love that you and I have experienced from God. And if we've experienced that from God, then that's something that we ought to uh, pour out to somebody else. And in order for that to pour out, there has to be some one anothering going on. There has to be some gathering going on. There has to be some togetherness going on. I don't care what your preference is. If you prefer just to be in solitude by yourself and never with anybody, and you think that, you know, just me and God, that's it. That's not how he designed things to be. There, there has to be some one anothering in, in your life going on. And whether that's only Sunday church, whether that's being part of a Bible study or anything like that, whether it's gathering online in a Zoom meeting or a FaceTime meeting, whatever kind of meeting, you know, even if face-to-face -face or not, there has to be some one anothering going on so that love can be given out and poured out. Reason number three is that it's an opportunity. More specifically, it's an opportunity for you and I to demonstrate the grace of God. Listen, God moves in the one another. And the more and more that we come to the realization that when we're all together, we're powerful. You know, uh, Paul would say this in Ephesians chapter 2, and, and we'll talk more about that next week. But he says that we are being built up together into a spiritual house. Together, one another, in our gathering. You know, uh, and if it's an opportunity, it's almost like, you know, you ever been to, uh, to you know, SeaWorld or places like that? There's this area where you sit in where it's called the splash zone, you know, and, and if you're in the splash zone, there's an opportunity that you might get wet. And, and, and so for us who are actually in the water, in the love of God, in a place where we realize how much God loves us, when we choose to be with one another and, and the, the one another's that we're going to be with, have never experienced the love of God, the splash zone of what God has done in our hearts might just transfer on to them. And that's the opportunity right there. Listen, the closer you are to love, the easy it is for you to just simply reflect the love of God. And this is an opportunity that I think that God wants to use us and move mightily through us. So that's the why. The why is important. Um, now here's the results. Because if we know that, that, that being with one another, gathering, being together, you know, if we're going to be built up into a spiritual house, that that's important, you know. So what would the result of that look like? If we became more intentional to the act of one anothering, what would that look like? So one simple sentence I'll give you, then I'll break it down a little bit more. But here's my simple sentence about what it would look like. I believe that we would see the kingdom of God a lot clearer in our midst. We would see God's hand move so much more clear. And we would be privy to the things that I believe that Acts Church, they saw a lot of miracles. Like people would be healed by shadows. You'd see Paul get bitten by some snake and he would just shake it off, you know, things like that. Where people thought that he was dead or, you know, some dude fell out of a window because Paul was preaching and he must not have been that great of a preacher because he put people to sleep. Hello. Anyways, the dude fell out of the window and Paul revived him. Those are the miracles that, that, that we, we saw in the book of Acts. And I don't think that that stopped happening in 2020. But if God's people would just be more intentional about the heart of why it's important to gather, I think the results will follow. So, if I were to break it down further for you, I think we would see these two things. So the results of, why, uh, of our gathering, here's uh, uh, one of them. You would see more growth. Love people thrive in an environment. The environment of love causes people to thrive. It causes people to let their guard down. It causes people to, to just be open and transparent. And then when we see that God loves us so much, no matter what we've done in our lives, he, he saved us before we were even, you know, considering walking worthy of his saving. Before, uh, you know, we were sinners and Christ died for us. Nonetheless, love people will always thrive. And when you can thrive, you're going to grow. 
It's really important when, when we're one another and, and we're with one another and, and Jesus says a new commandment I give to you and I choose for you to love one another. Man, that's how we, we, we're going to thrive. Second thing is that love people can move forward. They're rarely stuck. Or maybe if they are stuck, it's so much easier for them to get unstuck when they, uh, when they live purposeful and being with one another. It's those moments where like, man, I'm feeling kind of stuck here. And then my brother comes along and we go, hey, let me pray for you, man. Let's pray. And then, then something supernatural happens. And, and, and some people have choose to abandon the belief that prayer happens. Or maybe we say, okay, we'll pray for you, but you never really do. But man, if the church would just pray starting with one another, I think things would be so much different. Another reason why, why uh, we would see the result of growth happen in our midst, you know, is because as we choose to uh, uh, be with one another, going in the same direction with one another, in an environment where love causes us to thrive, I believe that we would grow in, in our relationship with God. I think that you would experience what it's like to be close really close to God, where you can have, where your prayers are not these just rehearsed um, lines where you're trying to sound like a TBN preacher or something like that, but it's just more of a dialogue consistently with God. That's something that I wish that all of us would, would be able to walk in consistently. Something, you know, I was in Utah just a, uh, um, you know, a, a week or so ago, and it was really neat to see. That we were in a place where there was like all kinds of hummingbirds. It was crazy. It was like, you know, God decided to move all the hummingbirds just into that location while we were eating dinner. And man, it was just neat. And my mind kept going, wow, Lord, I'm, I, I truly, truly marvel at the things that you've created. And, and if you see a hummingbird, it's like, a, a, it's like just this amazing you know, creature that God created that it just seems like it's standing still in midair. And, 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 you know, I want to be able to keep experiencing that where I see things and I, and, and I don't wait until later to give credit to God, but in that moment I can have a dialogue with God. That's what growing closer in a relationship with God ought to look like. It's when you open up the scriptures and just things are just so vivid and they just look so 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 real to you. And as you're reading, you're experiencing almost like this warm hug where he's holding you or he's reading it to you in that sense. I pray that we all experience love like, uh, growth like that. And I think that if we choose to keep being with one another and choose to abide in this one anothering that God has initiated and commanded us to do, I think those things will just be a natural by byproduct. Another area of growth it would be in your relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's, you know, when was the last time that you, you maybe hung out with a, uh, another brother or another sister and you just found out their story and let them talk and you shut up and listen? I think it would, it would bring you to a place where you would see God moving in their lives and you would give God glory for that. You know, nowadays we do this whole comparison thing. Like, you know, like if God did something in your life, then you're like, oh yeah, well, he better do something better in my life. No, that's not how it is. When you can truly be happy for your brother and sister, then you're going to grow with them. And if you're, if you're maybe some seasoned Christian and there's a young pup that, that just got saved, you know, today or yesterday, you know, and you would, you would, it would, those moments should cause you to reflect and remember what God did for you. And you wouldn't desire to, you'd want a desire to walk with them so that you can grow, uh, you know, alongside them and see, see the maturation that God will do um, through you in them. That's a neat thing to see. So growth is one result. And here's the second result. It's mission. God gave us a co-mission, something that he's going to do with us. You know, he, he, he gave us a co-mission in Matthew 28, 19. As you go, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's a mission that God gave his followers, his disciples. And right now, that just feels like a responsibility. It doesn't come naturally. It doesn't flow. But I think if we would stop and think about it, you know, the Bible says that he desires all men to be saved. 
And the vehicle that he uses is, this, is the gospel, the good news of Jesus. That's, that's what he uses. In Acts, we see this, this passion in believers to live in all that Christ had laid out for them. Uh, we see that, that to them, it just really wasn't, you know, nothing else really seemed to matter other than loving God and loving their neighbor which Jesus gave that as a commandment to them. He, re he reminded them of an Old Testament commandment. These are, this is the two cogs of where all the commandments lie. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. And as a result, the word of God increased. The, 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 the preaching of the word increased. The belief and the faith increased. And listen, you know, we see that in that space, in the book of Acts, we see that ministry became an overflow of everyone's love for God. And hear me out. That's ministry. Ministry is an overflow of your love for God. It's not this responsibility that God has laid on you. It becomes something that we value and want to do so deeply because of how much we love God and we love people. So then out of the overflow of all of that, that's what we call ministry. So, you know, to me, it was much, uh, um, well, it was more of who they were rather than a responsibility that they had to perform. You know, talking about Jesus just became something about who they, it, it's who they became. It, it, it was, in the book of Acts, we see so many instances of that, and we'll unpack these a lot more, but I just wanna magnify this because that's what happens in this concept of together, in this, in this mode of being together. You know, uh, another point on mission is that, you know, Jesus said that he was about the family's business. Now that he's brought us into the family, shouldn't we be about the family's business as well? And, and here's the thing to think about is that it's a lot easier for you to want to be a part and function in the family business when you're standing with family. That's why togethering is important. It's really, really important. Um, another thing uh, to think about is, you know, God is in the people business. And if people matter to God, then people should matter to us as well. There should be nobody that you and I throw away. There should be nobody, you know, in this crazy, crazy cancel culture that we have. We should not be in the business of canceling people. We should be loving people. Hear me, though. We don't love and compromise the Word of God. We don't love and compromise what God has, has, has uh, uh, asked from all of us, what He has commanded from all of us. That is something that we do not do. We do not abandon the conviction of the Holy Spirit for the sake of love. That's really, really important. So what if you love somebody, but you're just going to let them go to hell? To me, that's not okay. There, there's things. So, hey, man, I love you, bro, but dude, you are going someplace that I think is going to lead to some form of destruction, and you may not be able to come out of that. And I value you, and I love you too much to let you go that way. So come on. Walk with me. Show me. That's what happens when you're missionally minded into the things of together. So, you know, um, as we close, I, I, I want to, I just want to call to remembrance what following Jesus, what church, or even this thing called Christianity really is. And here's what I believe that it is. And as I read in the scripture as what it is. This, this concept of following Jesus, being his church or his bride, and, and, and this thing called Christianity, to me, it's a fellowship. It's a fellowship with God and fellowship with man. And I read this the other day. You know, Christianity started off as a fellowship, and then it went to Greece, and in Greece it became this philosophy. It went to Italy, and, and, and it turned into an institution. And here's the thing that really convicted me. It came to the United States and it became an enterprise. It became a platform for entertainment. Now listen, I don't want to just be in, in, in the... I'm not content with living and personifying and calling myself a child of God, but not living according to this. Everything that you and I see in here, it should challenge us to be able to take what's in here, into here, and assimilate it out into the world that you and I live in. And when we do that, I think that's our best way of honoring God. 
What if you and I chose to simply be closer to, to what we read about in that scripture, in the scriptures, when it comes to our acts of togetherness? What if we chose to filter our concept of gathering through the lens of God instead of our preference? Well, I'll go back to church when the church is open. Well, the church has never been closed and the church is still gathering. And if it's your preference to, to just gather only in the church building, I think you're missing out on what the scriptures really say, which means that you could be missing out on all kinds of supernatural blessings from God. And I want to be in a position where I can obey God, follow his commandments, walk his way. And I believe that's the best way for me to live out this life that I'm living on this planet. And if that's the case, what if we all did that? What if our, our concept of gathering wasn't just based on our preference, but based on what God says what if, that God says that it should look like. You know, in, in the Bible, uh, the book of Acts, uh, you know, this concept of fellowship, it's, it's in this word God called koinonia. If you, if you, those of you guys that are Bible scholars, go to Acts 2.42 where you see the word fellowship. Look in your strong concordance what that word fellowship is. It will give you this Greek translation of the word koinonia. And in our language, it's described as a partnership, a fellowship, association, it's community, it's communion, it's joint participation. That is what koinonia is. That's what fellowship is. And that's what church is. It's experiencing that kind of supernatural partnership with God and man. This fellowship with God and man. This, this, this uh, unbreakable association between God and man. This, this thriving, spirit-filled community between God and man. It's a joint participation in the things of God. Then we move forward and we grow in our relationship with God. What if we just really went for it, church, according to the pattern of God and not our preference? I don't know about you, man, but my heart is burning with desire to go after God with everything that we are. I hope that's the same thing for you. I hope, you know, just to kind of quote Paul here, I hope that you would follow me as I follow Christ because I'm really, really pressing it. To me, you know, gathering online and doing house churches, that's not a default thing. I'm not doing this because of coronavirus, but coronavirus, I believe, has shown me that, hey, you want to be really effective in winning people and, and, and for the kingdom of God, if you want to really be effective in discipling people into the things of God, then you need to embrace this concept of church in the homes. Because church, you know, if, when the building was open, there were so many people that would be put on this, this fake face at the building and then go home and their, how, their lives are a wreck, their marriages are a wreck, their relationship with their children are a wreck. And I don't think that that would happen if we were strong at home, if, if the fellowship of what we thought as church at the church was happening in, in, in the house. I think we would be strong at home. So let's go for it, church. I don't, what else do you have to lose? Here's what I think that you'd have to abandon. You'd have to abandon your concept of what your gatherings used to look like. Oh, but it was so nice when we would gather there at the church and the whole band was there. Yeah, but is that the only place where God lives? Because if he lives here, that means that wherever I go, that's where he's at. And what if we just simply called attention to that when we gathered? What if when we came over for dinner to somebody else's house and we just chose to eat there together because I'm carrying the presence of God with me, then that means the kingdom of God is right here. Let's just call attention to it. What if when we go hang out at Starbucks or whatever place is open, whatever coffee shop or restaurant is open, we go there and we just choose to, to um, allow the Holy Spirit to lead our gatherings. My God goodness we our gatherings would just be just be unreal and that's where i'm challenging you today based on what i've said today where do you find yourself having opportunity to obey god based on what you've heard today we should we should listen to the word of god to the preaching of the word the teaching of the word and find ourselves challenged where can you challenge yourself what is one thing that you can do to obey god today let me pray for you as we close here. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Father in heaven, I thank you so much, God. You've given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. And Lord, 
You've already sent your son to sacrifice and pay for our sins, Lord. And I thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit, for the power that's been, been clothed over us, Lord, that we've been endued with power from on high. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence. I pray right now, Lord, that those who are feeling less confident about gathering, that, Lord, that you would move them to a place, whether it's gathering on Zoom small groups or just participating with other people in their house, watching the messages online. I pray, God, that you would facilitate all of that. Thank you, Lord, that, that we have, if there's anybody that has a reason to gather and celebrate you, believers do. So we honor you and we thank you, God. Now, if, if you're listening to this, maybe maybe somebody dragged you into a, a house church, maybe that you're choosing to just gather for the very first time. Listen, I have a special prayer for you. Maybe you've been here, you know, you've seen church, but you never really gone and, and sunk your teeth in. I want to pray for you. Bow your heads, close your eyes. That's you. Actually, everybody, go ahead and bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to talk to that one soul that feels like they're so far from God. Father, right now, those that are watching, you know who they are. Would you speak to their heart right now? I thank you, God, that right now, even as I'm speaking, Lord, thoughts are coming into their head. That you're populating their mind, Lord, with good things. Your word says, as we lift you up, Jesus, you will draw all men unto yourself. I thank you, Lord, for those that you're drawing to yourself. Hear my voice now, friend. This only works if you choose to follow Jesus. And sometimes, sometimes just voicing and confessing that you're going to choose to walk with Jesus in the presence of other believers, that's the accountability that you need in order for it to actually go further. So if you want to follow Jesus, or maybe you want to recommit your life to Jesus, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Father in heaven, today, I'm making a new decision. I'm choosing to follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for surrounding me with such a great crowd of witnesses that the people that I'm in here, in this church with, in this building with, in this house with, Lord, you've surrounded me with people that will lead me closer to you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, do me a favor. There's some next steps that ought to happen. Go to nbhd.church. You can choose. There's there's a plethora. Just look for next steps. Click on there. If you want to... Uh, um, if you're interested in being part of a house church, go to our website. If you're um, interested in leading a house church, you can go to our website. Once again, nbhd.church. Um, at this time, uh, I'm going to ask all of our house church leaders to help facilitate giving. If you're at home by yourself, this is your time to give. And uh, let's be, listen, this is something that not necessarily is for us you know, gathering in the church, but it's also for you who is giving. The giver is always blessed. The tither is always blessed. He who sows will reap. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. So he who sows bountifully in abundance, he's going to reap in abundance. And if you think that I'm just after your cash, I've said this time and time again, go tithe to another church and watch, God will do something there for you. Go tithe to another house of God, God will do something there for you. But if you call this house your house, then you need to give. I, it's, not, it's not imperative that you give for our sake, for the church's sake, for the building's sake, for you know our house church's sake. It's more important for you because now you're relinquishing youth, what you think is authority in your money and you're freely giving it to the Lord. God honors that. So. There's a banner popping up here showing all kinds of vehicles for generosity. Give.nbhd.church is where you can go online or you can text to give 84321. Text any dollar amount and a link will be provided for you to select neighborhood church. Or if you want to mail it, there's a PO box listed down here below. I am so thankful for your time. I look forward to seeing you again, friend. 
God bless you. We'll see you next time.